welcome to Comics Crash Course. So today might seem straightforward, but it's pretty important to getting everyone on the same page. I'm going to break down the terminology of the elements of the comics form. So just like some of the stuff we've been doing the last two weeks regarding who makes comics, it's pretty important to know what makes up comics before you start talking about what those elements can do. So let's start with comics themselves. You'll notice that I call the form comics. Now people fight about the term for the form on the whole. Some folks don't like the word comics, in part because the word itself is connected to humor and has the connotation of comic books, and hence, you know, kid stuff, superheroes, that kind of thing. But quite frankly, those elements are the foundation of the form. Without humor magazines, satirical prints, caricature, and comic books, we wouldn't have the comics industry we have today, mainstream or independent. Besides, other terms folks have put forward just don't really work. For example, a popular alternative term is sequential art. But there are lots of forms of sequential art that aren't necessarily comics. So while comics are a form of sequential art, not all sequential art is comics. Graphic novel, another popular alternative, doesn't work either. See, a graphic novel is a type of comic. It refers to a long-form fictional comics story, a novel in comics, usually all published at once, as opposed to a trade or collected volume, which is a collection of material that had been previously published episodically, like in monthly issues or magazines, or floppies or flimsies if you're being informal. Now, Technically, a lot of graphic memoirs or graphic autobiographies get called graphic novels, but well, they're not novels at all, they're memoirs or autobiographies. And then there are works like Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics or Nick Susanis's Unflattening, which are, well, graphic essays. I may seem nitpicky, and I'm not going to beat you up for it, but it's good to be precise about these kind of things. So normally terms like title, series, and volume are pretty straightforward, but when it comes to mainstream superhero comics, they can get a little more complicated. <laughs> When people talk about the new Superman title, they might be talking about the new Superman series, which might not be named Superman. Series, title, and even book are all used to refer to a series, and in superhero comics, popular characters might feature in several series with several titles. So if a friend recommends that you read the new X-Men book, double check which one. This is also where volume comes in. In mainstream superhero comics especially, volume can refer to both the iteration of a collected trade paperback, so uh, this is the seventh volume of Ultimate Spider-Man, but it can also refer to something that happens when a series starts over, goes on hiatus, hits a milestone, or gets a new number one. Um, so this is the start of Volume 2 of Ultimate Spider-Man. It's uh, Volume 2, Volume 1, which picks up right where Volume 1, Volume 23 left off. I'm sorry. This is uh, frankly unnecessarily for snickety, but it's a thing that can happen. Uh, and if you want to know more, uh, you can email me. I'm not going to get into any more detail here. <laughs> So there are other formats of publication worth thinking about too, um, or that get mentioned in conversations about comics. Digest uh, refers generally to a size. It's a smaller format of publication that um, things like Archie Comics you'll find at the supermarket or especially manga get published in. Then there are zines. These are usually self-published in small numbers and independently sold. Web comics are published online and usually online first, but these days it's not uncommon for really popular web comics to then get published in trade volumes. Another publishing format that's been popular recently, especially among a lot of Kickstarted projects, is the anthology. So an anthology is when instead of the entire volume being one story, it's a lot of short, unrelated stories being published together in a single volume. Now, interestingly, this is kind of a throwback. In the Golden Age, a lot of monthly magazines were anthologies. So Action Comics number one, for example, the first appearance of Superman, was a pretty long issue, I think over 60 pages or so. But the Superman story is only the first handful of pages. It's only about eight pages. The rest of the issue was filled with short stories about other characters. Okay, so now we're going to move away from the books to what's in the books themselves. So one of the most important elements of comics, and one that often gets ignored because it seems really obvious, is the page. 
But the page is the fundamental unit of storytelling, and it has its own compositional unity, something we'll talk about later, as well as holding a bunch of little compositional units together inside of it. So in printing, you can be really fancy and refer to the recto, or the front side of the page, and the verso, or the back side. So when a page is open to a double spread, verso is going to be on the left and recto on the right. The page turn is also a really important moment in comics. It's a key moment of narrative reveal, a moment of surprise, and good comic artists know how to manipulate that moment to full effect. So when an image goes across more than one page, it's called a spread. And the most common is the double page spread. I referred to it just briefly a second ago. And that's when it goes across two open pages. Every so often, there are spreads that go across more than two pages, like this one by Jim Steranko, which was four pages. Uh, for obvious reasons, it's pretty uncommon because it requires some uh, publishing trickery to, to get through, including weird folded pages and that kind of thing. Oh, a thing that happens more in mainstream comics, and especially superhero comics than elsewhere, is what's called a splash or a splash page. This is the first page of a story, and it's usually a full page or mostly full page illustration. So, if pages are the paragraphs of comics, panels are its words. Yes, that's what we call the boxes. Not boxes or frames. Inside the industry, we call them panels. And we call them panels whether there's actually a physical borderline or it's an implied border. The space between panels is equally important. So important, it has its own name the gutter. And again, uh, we talk about the gutter, whether there's an actual physical space, a white space, or it's implied by a line. This separation between panels is, like the space between words, how we make sense of and differentiate between the individual units of the page, which are, as I mentioned, panels. So layout or composition get used pretty interchangeably to refer to the way that panels are arranged on a page. When a panel doesn't have a border and the image runs to the end of the page, that's called a bleed. This is more of a publishing term than a formal term, but you'll see them used occasionally. And if an image runs to the end of all four edges of the page, it's called a full bleed. Now, inside panels live a wealth of objects. This here is called a caption box. It's used for text that's not spoken speech. Spoken speech goes into a word balloon. Now I have it on good authority that the term balloon is what's preferred by industry insiders over bubble, which tends to get used by critics uh, and readers. So I think we should make it standard. Now if it's spoken speech, it's a word balloon or a speech balloon. If it's a thought, it's a thought balloon, but balloon is just generally what it's called. These things that designate sound, they are super interesting and we're going to have a whole video on them. They are called sound effects. Now this kind of stuff here isn't really a sound effect, but it's things that are used to mark stuff that comes off people or things, emotions, smells, essentially anything that's not sound. That's called emanata. Oh, and another word doesn't get used a ton, but it's one of the great neologisms of English is the grawlix. It's the word for typographical uh, inserts to avoid swears. So if somebody is swearing but you get the little symbols instead, Grawlixes. So there'll be a lot more that comes up as we go, but I think this is a pretty good start, especially for a lot of the terms that I'll be using regularly. Next week we're going to start looking at the form itself and how it works, just like I promised three episodes ago. We'll see you then. I hope you've been enjoying Comics Crash Course. If you'd like to help us out, I encourage you to click like, to tell your friends to check out our channel, and as always, to hit subscribe.